So thank you very much, folks, for joining um, tonight. As you know, this is part of three months of programming we're doing uh, as the Peace and Justice Studies Association. Uh, PJSA has an annual conference every year. Uh, tends to be the, the center kind of social nexus around what the rest of the year focuses. And like most people, this year we're not gathering in person. Um, and so we have decided to shift this into three months of programming each month around a particular theme. So we finished September uh, with a focus on uh, restorative justice. And this month being October, we are focused on narrative and storytelling. And next month we will focus on polarization. Um, and so what we want to do tonight is to, to focus the conversation on narrative and storytelling in a particular direction and around a particular text. Um, I guess I'm playing two roles in this. Uh, one, as the executive director of PJSA and um, uh, part of the conference committee that organized this conference. I, I thank you in a sense for joining. Um, and also I'm the co-editor of the book in which tonight's speakers are drawn from. Um, it's worth noting uh, that myself and Lee, my co-editor, um, who will be speaking in a little bit, started this book as a discussion. I went through my email today just to confirm that this is actually the case, but um, started this book as a discussion in 2016. Um, so it, it was nearly four years in the making. Um, and we began it as a book uh, discussing trauma, uh, specifically the trauma faced by direct action or frontline or engaged activists. Um, I had been thinking through and dealing with trauma, working in conflict zones. We had our own uh, experiences um, in Brazil, thinking about and working through uh, traumatic areas. And we had originally proposed this idea where we would write a book about how, in a sense, activism is informed by trauma. And slowly and somewhat subtly, it, it evolved. Um, and it evolved into this notion of, of ecological trauma. And, and in a sense, the grief and the stories that are produced by that. Um, in a sense, when I think about the book and what ties everything together, it focuses at the kind of the intersection of trauma and infrastructure, trauma and what we've done to the natural environment. And in a sense, we all focus in very different ways on the existential trauma of entering the age in which humans are changing the, the natural environment around us, right? The age of the Anthropocene. And the chapter that I wrote, which I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna discuss um, today, be begins from the assumption that if, um, if mainstream science logic and, and rational discourse tells us that we're reaching a, a crisis point, right? That it's not just something that's bad, but something that's actually reaching a, a crisis point, then, then that would call us to revisit our notions of, of what an appropriate response is to that. Um, and that notions of legality and illegality and ethical and unethical maybe aren't the best benchmarks um, not only are they set by, by people with varied interests other than our own, um, but they don't really capture what we're looking at. And so I want to kind of begin with a posit that if we acknowledge this as a crisis, then we have to acknowledge that what comes out is also a crisis, is also a crisis response. And that all of the stories that people share are rooted in trauma, but in a particular kind of collective trauma. Um, because some of us are speaking about the causes of those traumas and some of us are speaking about the, the effects um, and, and the occurrences within these new normals. And so tonight we're kind of calling this narrative and storytelling. And we're going to focus on five authors who have shared their stories about uh, ecological crisis, ecological grief, uh, the way in which this is informed by, by, by trauma and the way in which we can start to examine this through the notion of storytelling. And so I want to just begin by reading one small quote um, that, I, that I use in the chapter. Um, like I said, the chapter that I looked at looks at this kind of existential at this point. And also, I'm trying to look at how grief informs these actions. And so in looking through, in, Simon, no, I'm looking through hundreds of um, uh, communiques, thousands of communiques, actually, over the course of uh, about 10 years of doing, doing this and another project, I, I've, I've read a fair bit of this. And when I think of ones that are kind of informed by grief, I almost always um, think about this one. And so I want to read it, um, just a, an excerpt from it. So this is from uh, 2014. It's from a tree spiking when, when activists um, drive giant nails into trees to prevent them from being logged. It says, we spiked trees in the Brigier Forest. With anger and love, we hiked through the southeastern Florida forest and threw six-inch nails into the gears of the capitalist death wish. We pulled survey stakes and buried them in the woods. We tore the markings off trees, 
We worked with heavy hearts knowing that we may be the last humans to enter this forest without chainsaws in our hands. And if no one intervenes, the creatures surrounding us will be crushed beneath the tread of this machinery so that the rich can expand their kingdoms. That without a fight, soon the only animals living on this piece of earth will be those forced into cages as test subjects of poisonous and genetic manipulation. Before the rising sun threatened to expose us, we took rest in beds of pine needles, listened to the growls of bobcats and sons of Chickawill widows, and spoke words of solidarity and gratitude for those who risk their freedom to defend the earth. And what I write is that throughout these accounts, you, you, you hear this grief, you hear this loss as something which informs people into radical action. So I want to pause it there. More, more mammals enter my my off. <laughs> Um, and uh, I want to pass it over to Lee, who is the, the co-editor of this book and will be our first um, panelist. So thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, I approached this book, even though we started talking about it from the perspective of, of trauma, um, I really moved away from there. My uh, chapter ended up sort of being like a, a, a sort of a centrist bridging narrative that I created for... Um, sort of drawing these different ideas together that having from the perspective of seeing everybody's uh, chapters sort of up front. And uh, tonight I'm, I'm moving away if, if even further and sort of riffing off that chapter to... Um, uh, I've created a presentation um, for, primarily for, uh, for uh, people... Uh, that are working in environmental justice issues, but for undergraduates um, that probably don't have a very good understanding of sustainability issues. And again, as a sort of a, a more of a centrist text that sort of look, sort of deconstructed an economic underlying narrative and sort of the political narrative, um, I'm sort of sticking to that, but trying to segue toward conceptualising and, and um, visualising climate change responses and also explaining what they are. So I'm going to, or, or what they are for the general public rather, not for people that are really engaged scholars or familiar with this. So I'm going to try and share my screen with this PowerPoint here that I have. Great, so I seem to be screen sharing now. And I'm gonna just go ahead and um, try and get you out of here. There we go. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, terrific. Here I go, really fast. So yes, tonight I'm going to be talking about visualising and conceptualising environmental and climate change communications, um, riffing off my chapter, which was about environmental policy and politics. And what we're facing now is a communications challenge. So what I'm hoping to be able to impart tonight are some really basic ideas. The most effective way to tell stories about climate change is by integrating best case and worst case scenarios into a single storyline because they're not very effective if we see them in isolation from one another. The most effective imagery that we use shows one or two people actively engaged in creating a positive impact. Now these um, are embedded in notions of efficiency and productivity. They, they don't question the endless goals of production, consumption and growth but what they do do is bridge the sort of the conservative mind Mindset. They sort of fit easily in, in with them. So images of solutions tend to make people feel more able to do something about climate change, but they don't necessarily convey a sense of threat or risk. And dramatic, uh, extreme weather images are good at capturing people's attention because they're emotionally powerful. Local serious impacts reduce physical, dis uh, reduce psychological distancing from the topic of climate change, but they can also leave people feeling overwhelmed and helpless. And the more people or animals that are depicted in an image, the less people have the capacity to empathise with them. And this is called the compassion fade. So audiences prefer seeing authentic images over staged photographs. The um, 
the good old polar bear on melting ice is also really received positively still. Um, it's, it's a really effective way for communicating this is a story about climate change with people with limited knowledge or interest in the subject. But it's also it can be a very distancing sort of image that conveys a sense that climate change isn't happening to us and it's really far away. Less familiar and more thought provoking images can help tell a new story using humour or contrast and irony to remake visual representation in the public mind. People don't necessarily understand the links between climate change and their daily lives. Um, and uh, sort of con being confronted with uh, individual causes may provoke defensive reactions. So uh, when we're showing problematic behaviours and climate change, it's best to show the behaviours at scale. And no matter what, um, every story presents a problem of striking the right balance. Um, generally across the political spectrum, people neither like to see um, images of, of protests or staged photographs of politicians. Cartoons are really effective for communicating. They help get the message across quickly and effectively. Um, they uh, also create understanding shortcuts and the humour relieves tension. So it puts everything more into perspective. But what about the stories behind the stories? Uh, one of the, the, the sort of the images that I like, uh, or the, the, the sort of the conceptual stories that I like most is this, this sort of um, uh, analogous um, uh, concept of how many um, Hiroshima bombs worth of heat we're pumping into the planet. We're pumping five every second of every day, just on and on and on, that's getting trapped in our oceans and, and uh, and building up heat. Um, another really sort of basic um, way of sort of conceptualizing um, climate change and consumption is that if everyone in the US, um, uh, if everyone lived like we do in the US, we'd need five planet Earths to keep up. Uh, we make so we need so much stuff all the time here. We need the materials to build our homes, the energies to heat it, the pipelines, the infrastructure, our garbage, the space for, for our sprawl, the, the space to produce our food and the factories where we make our stuff and get our fuel from overseas. Uh, so if we're living in the US, we're living large. Um, often uh, people try and um, correlate um, this sort of consumption with population. But when we realise that the wealthiest 7% produce 50% of carbon emissions, this sort of falls apart. And by focusing the debate on population, blames the poor in other countries for the affluence that we're enjoying in the US. With 5% of the world's population, we use a third of the world's paper, a quarter of the world's oil, coal, aluminum, and almost 20% of copper. And do we really care? No. Out of uh, 17 rich countries, we're the least likely to act sustainably and the least likely to care about it. But clearly some of us do care and want to connect the dots on issues. And this is important because there's a greater possibility of developing awareness if people have integrated information on these issues. Now COVID itself can feel like a sped up analogy for climate change. Um, it amplifies issues of inequity, uh, economics, the role of public institutions, and it exposes the difficulties we have communicating the slow burn of threat of climate change. But some things have shifted. We've got more opportunities now as long-term behavioural shifts are occurring to open up the possibilities for shifting behaviours and introducing altruistic storylines, especially about empowerment and protection for the vulnerable. Uh, but we have to be careful in our timing and sensitivity because people are overwhelmed with worry and are facing trauma and they may be resentful if, we're, if we suggest that there may be another trauma recurring on top of the one they're already dealing with. 
we're also living in a culture of climate change denial as we know there's a scientific consensus but media coverage is really low and public perception is really poor. So these stories coming out of the media are influenced by climate lobbying that's negatively influenced policy debates for decades. And the way in which climate change is reported is one of the most egregious example of that, examples of that. You know, uh, oil firms are spending a lot of money on climate lobbying and that's reflected in our media scapes. We're also dealing with misinformation campaigns through Russian trolls. This is another sort of ubiquitous story that's um, going through our social media systems and also by uh, right-wing think tanks that are publishing and distributing tens of thousands of climate denial uh, pseudo textbooks to every middle and high school throughout the education system and if you think about being a resource stressed public school teacher in the US and you get a book about something that looks like science and it's got a DVD wow that's great so um, we have educational policy, even now judicial, as we're seeing. Uh, landscapes are being subverted by interest groups. And these are complex stories that sort of we can unravel by following the money. And there's lots of layers to those. The Heartland Institute producing these textbooks, uh, funding policy makers, funding lobbyists, and sort of going into these feedback loops. But climate change is also um, being seen, climate science is seen as a culture war. And we have a, a really strong ideology of denial in the US. Um, we're at a record high for people that do believe in climate change, but still not many people want to talk about it. It's a really complex threat. Uh, it's got all kinds of issues attached to it that are phenomenal to try and explain at the best of times, let alone visualize or um, uh, create from sort of scientific data. So we have to go back to telling stories about ourselves, the story of us being connected and the story of us now, not in the future. So we have uh, growing threats, floods, wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, tornadoes. Why aren't we panicking? Because things are getting too complex, there's too much volatility, ambiguity, uncertainty, and we already have lag times, like the lag time between our building envelopes and our deficit infrastructure um, don't correlate with our advances in technology or organisational changes. And we also even have problems like reconciling our sustainability paradigms, you know, the old triple bottom line versus a more sort of... Uh, 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 ecosystemic um, social ecology paradigm but we have to operate we have to update our societal operating systems because the quality of results produced by a system depends on the quality of awareness from the people in that system and here we're falling down as well our relationship to decision making is poor in fact it's a leading cause of death in the United States and we've got a problem overcoming our evolutionary psychology we have this understanding of eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we may die and it's called the distributional effect of justice over time. It creates a disconnect between our present self and our future self, creating the results that nobody wants. And this is also true of our planet. We're uh, plundering so many resources that we're shooting, ec overshooting ecological capacity and we're beginning to face the cr critical consequences of that now. So given that we're living in the Anthropocene, how do we change the stories and cosmologies we live by? Um, well, we can begin to listen to existing stories coming out of indigenous and subaltern narratives uh, that are already attuned to nature and caring for the world and, and caring for each other. Uh, we can begin paying attention to what those groups are actually achieving. They're behind a lot of um, the pushes towards getting personhood laws enacted, concepts of caring for the earth as a living entity, uh, common health through restoration ecology. And these changes are happening through networks and micro-political actions, which together are forming mosaics of resistance. Um, we also need to decolonize our storytelling. Uh, indigenous people have been historically left out of the decision-making processes relating to their affairs. 
and uh, this goes for everything from fishing rights to the creation of national parks. It's something that Terry Jones called apartheid ecology back in the 70s. Uh, so mainstream environmentalism can obfuscate counter narratives of marginalised people. So we have to pay attention to that. But what might a positive story of co-production look like? And this is a project I directed quite some time ago now, but it's still relevant. Um, it was on uh, Dene, Navajo Nation. Uh, so we had Indigenous youth build a community house out of repurposed materials on the res, and we facilitated a two month long Indigenous teaching, gave filmmaking workshops, taught production and post-production skills, gave cameras and editing equipment, computers and um, editing software to youth to go out and make their own environmental justice stories. We helped them distribute their films to throughout their chapter houses, worked with an Indigenous mining reclamation group to produce PSAs to distribute to to the wider public about the dangers of uranium and coal, showcased all the films that a Smithsonian sponsored um, a Native American uh, film festival and at a local cinema in Santa Fe, led Native environmental justice panels, um, uh, gave Indigenous led animation workshops to the younger kids, created a green chamber of commerce, worked to train people. Uh, uh, in careers in renewable energy, raised funds to install renewable energy on Navajo Nation, worked with Indigenous networks to pressure Congress to fund the cleanup of a uranium mine and the largest uranium spill outside of Chernobyl and Fukushima. Uh, we worked with the Health Research Network to get funding to begin the first health impact study of that area on the impacts of uranium mining and uh, worked with a youth group uh, with, with a group of youth to help them uh, write, present and pass cap and trade legislation um, that they uh, pushed through um, at a state level and actually became the most advanced cap and trade policies in place in the US. Um, we also uh, took a pile of uh, coal, 2.3 tonnes, equivalent to what every person uses in a, in a year, and um, plonked it down on the floor of a, a museum with a lot of other stuff happening. And uh, about 350 people came with paper bags and put some coal in a bag. We walked it down to the state legislative building and handed it to the legislators as they exited the building, uh, telling them that we wanted a new energy economy. We also created a documentary where um, students went out and created and asked people and asked public members of the public where their electricity came from out of a uh, hundred people only two knew um, we also know that communicating sustainability through nature relatedness is really effective and improves our physical and mental health um, on a personal level but also on a societal level so we also might think about a multitude of ways of investing in nature because it has really positive implications for advancing sustainability initiatives. We know that spending time even with mediated images of nature, watching nature videos has a really positive implica implication for how we be behave sustainably. Um, there was focus groups comparing how we're working with uh, people that were shown um, nature videos as opposed to architecture videos and uh, and most of those and all those people came out of that um, these tests that um, did uh, with pro environmental behaviors so given what we know about responses to nature imagery if we use nature focus images rather than economic or national security framings we might advance uh, cooperation a big challenge is getting people to believe that it's possible in the US but if we um, foster creativity, cradle to cradle design, social interventions, strategic interventions, and all sorts of um, these coalitions of things that are already happening, we get further down the track. And there's also other really clever ways that people are working, like this Canadian artist that um, copyrighted his land as an artwork so the, um, so the pipeline couldn't uh, be pushed through. There's another, um, uh, person who started a, um, a carbon offset program by buying a piece of land and reforesting it to offset the servers of, of uh, game he played and he fundraised for that through the game. 
Um, so mapping collectives and coordinated responses are also sort of building stories about regenerative agriculture and regenerative energy landscapes in response to the crises that people are facing. Uh, for example, along the Mississippi River that spills into the Gulf of Mexico and creates these huge dead zones every year. Um, citizen science in itself is a form of environmental education that has several layers. We have community engagement and public services where we're providing free services to uh, such as food banks and books to members of the public that can't afford them. We can support our youth um, that are already challenging the legal system now all over the world. Um, our Children's Trust has is, is started to mm -hmm in um, Eugene, Oregon. Um, and we have a lot of uh, knowledge about positive messaging, how we can use social incentives, uh, immediate rewards and highlighting progress rather than de decline to bridge our perceptual gaps. I won't talk more about that because I know I've run out of time. So uh, to wrap up, using human-centered narratives together with productive visual aids and broad stroke messages to tell integrated stories, um, helps us um, come out with better uh, environmental and recovery um, narratives. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you very much, Lee, for, for probably the only person I've met in a while who speaks faster than I do. In <laughs> yeah, I had, I had to have a shot of coffee before that. <laughs> that's, that's impressive. We, we appreciate that. Um, we appreciate so, <laughs> So I'm 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 off now, right? I'm no longer screen sharing. Uh, you do appear to still be screen sharing. Oh, sharing is poor. Stop share. Okay, hey. there we go. Thank you. I hope I didn't go too far over the time limit. So next, we're gonna turn to Jen. Great, thanks, Leah. And a few of the things I'm going to say certainly relate very much to your statements about communication and uh, engagement. And um, talks about climate change used to be the purview of climate scientists offering like numerous slides and graphs and copious objective data about uh, greenhouse gas levels and rising temperatures and floods and fires and droughts, et cetera, and pandemics. Um, and that scientific Information, of course, is, has been really vital and has presented a, the wake-up call that we needed, but it was so based and has been based and still is based in some ways on a belief that if people just knew the information and saw the threat, that they would just change their behavior. Um, but finally, the link between um, behavior change and perceptions, beliefs, needs, and values um, has been made. And, social scientists and adult educators like myself and like, like Leo was saying, are influencing and humanizing climate, climate communications and doing that a lot through by bringing in individual um, stories and narratives and experiences. And the confrontive wake up call um, have actually created such complexity and darkness that people, um, Instead of engaging, we're, we're backing away and becoming despairing and apathetic. So it's in this area of communication, of honestly facing the facts, the uncertainty, um, the upheaval, the stress and the anguish, and finding resilience that I'm wanting to speak to directly today. And, um, and of course, I mean, the climate destabilization sits amongst the many, many other destabilizing issues of racial injustice, poverty, rise of fascism, and now we've got COVID. Um, so it's really understandable that we may feel overwhelmed and distraught. And um, in fact, in many ways, it would be strange and almost dissociative if we did not feel concerned about the future of our children and other species. However, um, Expressing vulnerability and concern can be really difficult in a culture that applauds success and happiness and being in control. And being happy and capable can be associated with being a winner, whereas anguish or grief can be associated with being a loser, a failure, and lead to shame and hiding. And um, 
survey by the L program on climate change communication indicated that more than half of Americans who claim climate change is personally important to them rarely or never discuss the topic with family or friends. And silence creates isolation and paralysis, which then creates personal and societal, um, less uh, personal and societal resilience. And we, you know, we certainly can't work together on something that we're not even going to talk about. And there is such a fear of talking about the impacts of climate change. And, you know, people aren't wanting to be considered to be a downer and people aren't wanting to risk getting into a polarizing rant. So indeed the kind of ordinary casual conversations do not seem to support, support the kind of discussion that we need on this. And we're left in this sort of crazy making silence, like we may be facing the extinction of so much we hold dear, but we're not gonna mention it. And, and you know, it is an understandable survival technique um, to push away that which is overwhelming. But there certainly are other healthier options that may increase our collective chances at survival and to bring our best selves forward. And people often refer to Joanna Macy. She was a scholar of system thinking, deep ecology and Buddhism. And she saw that the inaction that resulted from socially unexpressed grief and fear and anger. And she was one of the first to provide workshops to break the silence to give a safe place for people to come together and talk um, and to transform the, the psychological and spiritual despair that they had into a deep connection about what they really loved and wanted to defend. So just to give some examples of, of what I mean, I've got some quotes from participants of groups that, that I've run on the topic of grief, grit and gratitude and finding resilience. And one person said, I noticed I leaned forward and had a hunger to hear where other people were at and facing this trauma. Another one said, what I assumed I would dread saying and acknowledging is actually feels, you know, like more life-giving, more expansive. I feel, feel more energy. Another one said that I, I noticed I feel a bit lighter and maybe a little bit more brave about the future we are facing. And so this is just after, a, you know, a, a short, few hours of workshop time in which it was just the time to be able to talk together. And I think this is becoming more common now because we are seeing the intensity of what we're facing and the, uh, the capacity to talk about it um, is actually making us stronger. Community support can alter the impact of trauma and actually help us to grow. In a study following the Fukushima nuclear reactor after the 2011 earthquake in Japan, found that the more tight-knit and trusting the community was before the disaster, the higher their chances were of rebuilding after the disaster. And stories of community support and heroism have also been reported by residents of both California and Beast Bridge Columbia, where I live, um, indicating gratitude for the support received after devastating fires that swept through the communities in the last few years. Um, I mean, there's certainly, is a post-traumatic stress from the fires and floods and forced migration. Certainly not wanting to gloss over any of that. It's terrifying and uh, destroying on many levels. But there's also stories of post-traumatic growth, an increased sense of personal resilience and appreciation for what was previously taken for granted, and also a deep community bonding. And studies have shown this resilience increases when there is some process available to help people talk together during and after the traumatic event and to help make sense of just kind of what's happened and make sense of the loss and the trauma. And so there is, um, so this story, sharing of stories and sometimes using nonverbal or artistic forms of expression is seen as being really important to people being able to um, come back from the constant um, threat and fear that they feel they're under. Um, and facing climate-related traumas would certainly qualify for what sociologist and adult educator Jack Mesereau would call disorienting dilemmas that trigger potential for transformation 
transformational thinking and learning um, and more complexity um, of being more adaptive complexity if adequate support is being provided. And so there are more groups now looking at doing post-disaster support. Also studies are showing that those who are actively involved in climate change advocacy have an improved sense of health and, and well-being as a result of being, being part of those activities. This is not due to, you know, magically the problem being solved, but it's more based on there being an opportunity to be of meaningful service, to shift from being inactive consumers of scary news reports, being silently complicit in the damage, into being active agents of change. And this engagement helps people manage the stress and adjust to the change context, as well as look ahead and seeing what actions they could take to be more preventative. Agency or this power for individuals as well as societies to take to act purposefully to their advantage is key to the biological evolution of organisms and to the social evolution of, of civilization. So, I mean, certainly responding to climate change is an evolutionary challenge for all species. And agency means taking substantive actions, not just engaging in distractions or feel good busy work. And many people, including the climate activists, often conflate expressing grief with giving up. They may be so afraid of being accused of spreading doom and gloom that they feel they must quickly jump to offering kind of a, a cheerleading reassurance, but there are things we can do. And of course there are things we can do, but in the urgency of trying to rally people to act while this vital window for creating change is still open, there can be a fear that even any acknowledgement of concern means everyone is just gonna drop out of action and, and into the swamp of endless despair. So quite often within the activist circles themselves, there is this, a way of shutting ourselves down and, and not allowing uh, ourselves to connect with each other and with that which is so meaningful, which at times means we do need to discuss the despair and the grief. And grief is not an enemy of hope. That's a limited either or binary argument, and both can exist alongside many other emotions, and, and they all basically indicate that we care. And resiliency, um, it, it requires that we flexibly dance among these many naturally arising emotions and, and the shifting ground of social and climate upheaval. And just to add that, you know, even in, in my many years, I've been working on social justice and climate advocacy for a long time, and still, like every week and sometimes every day, I go through my spiral of different emotions from deep grief and shock and guilt and just wanting to pull the covers over my head to being in a moment lifted by gratitude for the fact that we got clear blue skies again or you know, someone was very friendly in the store or something. Um, and also buoyed up by being really engaged in meaningful action. And then I can kind of go around the cycle and kind of wonder, like, really, are those actions that meaningful? Are they going to make any difference? And I bring this up because I really want to stress the importance of our consciously attending to our mental well-being. Um, and I find that keeping aware and accepting my different feelings and the fact that they keep moving helps me from getting stuck in one feeling and one belief about the world and about the future. And I wanted to raise another phenomena that exists in the, the field of climate anxiety and resilience. There's a question about whether it's too late to take remedial action or not. There is a question about whether we'll make it or not, or if the extinction is inevitable, or whether we can still make a difference. And I think this is just another binary argument that attempts to reduce our current complex and you know, totally unfamiliar situation to fit into a pretty oversimplified deterministic either or prediction, predictable response. Like, we polarize over so many things and it's, I mean, it's, um, 
it's almost laughable if it was not so serious that people are so adamantly polarized over this question. And for example, there's people like Jem Bendall and Carolyn Baker and Michael Dowd on one hand strongly advocating that people need to be just really be honest about the reality of short-term extinction and put their energies into getting ready to die. Whereas other people like Guy Dauncey and Christina Figueres and Paul Hawkins advocate that people should put their energies into a taking action that can move us on a different trajectory and stabilize the rise in climate temperatures in a way that is just and creative. In a culture that is so predicated on only investing resources if you know for sure you're going to get a good return, I guess it's understandable, even though somewhat bizarre, that people are trying to figure out the certainty of results before committing to the action. I remember that years ago, the husband of a friend of mine would roll his eyes when he heard my climate advocacy work as to him, the climate issue was just not a reality and I was wasting my time. But I saw him a year ago and he lectured me to get real and realize that the climate issues were so bad that I was wasting my time if I thought I could do anything about it. So there exists this rapid flip between, I don't know anything about it to, I can't do anything about it. And both of these stances can justify doing nothing not having to work on something if it feels murky or complex or challenging, if it's just too hard. And I, I'd like to insert this great quote that Zaklav Havel, who is the past president of Czechoslovakia, gave. And he said, hope is definitely not the same as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. It is hope, above all, that gives us strength to live and to continually try new things, even in conditions that seem as hopeless as ours do here and now. In the face of this absurdity, life is too precious a thing to permit its devaluation by living pointlessly, emptily, without meaning, without love, and finally without hope. And this was written in 1990, and it also shows that we have faced times of despair before. In fact, likely myself as a privileged older white settler like myself, um, who is newly coming to terms with the challenge of finding resilience in the face of devastation, has to be aware that many, many indigenous people have faced the devastation of all they held dear and had to keep finding ways to look for the light together. And we are certainly facing, what we're facing certainly is daunting, and we need to have the grit to develop our personal and community resilience for the long haul. And at the end of the chapter in the book that's been published, I put out a few ways that through my search have been helpful, and I won't go into all of them because I know I'm probably running out of time too, but I just wanted to say, you know, finding real specific experience of gratitude every day, taking some, having a practice of doing that and not thinking it's corny to, you know, to really be aware in your body, how the sun feels, uh, you know, something that smells good in terms of food, but really being in your senses and feeling gratitude is really important. Really noticing the sneaky erosion of cynicism because it's certainly easy to come in. Uh, and to not be doing this work alone, join a group. And I would really suggest Citizens Climate Lobby is a great, supportive, appreciative, relational advocacy group. It's got 600 chapters around the world. And there's a lot of other ones in your local communities. They're really important to do this with other people who are positive, supportive people who are honest about what's going on. And in the midst of the bad news about all the things that are falling apart, is to keep looking at what things are rising because there's a lot of creativity and innovation happening that we are um, changing a lot of things that are, um, that really are looking like humanity in some ways is evolving as well as falling apart. And being able to see how do we keep bringing the best self forward so we can keep evolving um, consciously to, to meet these challenges without having to be Pollyannish about it. So I'll leave it for there and uh, pass it on to the next person.
Thank you very much, uh, Jen. Uh, it's a very powerful approach, and, and I've, I've read your chapter, and I actually I think there is a lot. There's a lot in there about um, strategies for, for for dealing with some of these things. And again, it, I think most directly it, it links us back to the conversation that we kind of began the book with, which is, you know, how we are informed by the the traumas around us and how we we bring that into our own world. And yeah, I want to thank you for that. Um, our next presenter is Eileen. Um, yeah, I'll pass it over to you. Can you hear me now? Good. Oh, uh, yes. So um, greetings from southeastern British Columbia. Uh, I live in a densely mountainous landscape west of the Rocky Mountains. I have lived here for a quarter of a century and my work here is very situational. I am situated in one place and all of my work in, with regards to forming narrative has uh, come from my relationship with the landscape. So it's very important to me when I talk about uh, environmental loss and resistance and the formation of narrative that um, I first of all talk about the experience of bonding, um, otherwise known as love, uh, and how that informs um, all of the work that I do. And I think it's just the simplest way forward that we have. And that is to love and care for each other and for the places that we live in and to consider our locations, wherever they are, to be paramount in the work that we're doing. Um, I want to take you to a, a rainy night uh, about, let's see, where are we? 2003 uh, was the rainy night. So how many, how many years ago is that? 17 years ago when the telephone rang in my house and I answered it and it was the director of a storytelling festival that uh, was a local event. And he was asking me whether or not I would be able to write a story about the history and the experience of the landscape that was not focused on people. And I sort of was taken aback uh, at the request. I thought it was a very, um, a very forward looking, uh, very progressive suggestion. And I, without really thinking much about it, said, of course I can. And then I hung up and I thought, oh, like, what am I going to do? How am I going to tell a story that is not about people? Because I think our typical understanding of narrative is that we are reading about people and what people do. And um, Leah, even your presentation uh, made it really clear that people are paramount in most of our lives in our understanding of story and of um, what happens, if you will. And so that was really a very beginning point um, following my um, book that had been produced about Indigenous history of the area, where I realized that I was maybe going to be able to be a storyteller, not just involving people and cultural history, but also involving land and water and non-human uh, experiences on the earth. And it was a pivotal moment in my work. Um, I ended up writing a story about the fourth largest watershed in North America. Uh, the center of that watershed is the Great Columbia River. And I actually became the Columbia River. Uh, I imagined myself to be that river. Uh, and as often happens when you are a creative person, I was woken up at between 3.30 and 4 a.m. one morning, having done some research, some thinking, and was, you know, pretty much driven out to my studio where I sat down and began to write and wrote the, the story of the Columbia River largely in one sitting. Uh, and I did so by calling upon something that storytellers do, which is calling upon empathy. Um, it's very hard to tell a story without empathizing about 
what you're telling about. And so I became the river and the, the first line in this book um, was, I would like you all to imagine for a moment that you are water. And this sent me on this narrative of the Columbia telling its story starting with its formation hundreds of millions of years ago, moving through glacial periods, uh, and then moving on through the indigenous period where indigenous peoples lived in reciprocity with this river and counted on a very important species in this river, which was the ocean salmon that came up from the Pacific. And then into the period of dam building and the experience the river had of being dammed. And in doing that, I called upon all my creative abilities to imagine what it might have been like for a river to get dammed. Um, it was, had a high impact as a story. Uh, people approached me afterwards who wanted to turn it into a book. Uh, it was printed, then reprinted, distributed locally. Um, recently, many years later, I embarked on uh, um, an effort that was, I was requested, would I read my story in the school system to children? And I went across uh, one autumn, I, by the end of the autumn, I had read it to over 1,200, 1,300 school children in our rural districts around where I live. And that was where I became really clear about the power of narrative to uh, inspire uh, and to form um, some kind of understanding to find our way through to this, I believe, new era that we are entering, uh, a, a progressive era that is gonna bring us back into direct right relation with our ecosystems. I am a positivist, I will admit that, uh, but I do believe that something is changing and turning I had an experience with those children that I could go on the rest of my time talking about how they responded with equal empathy and concern and love to the river's story. One that speaks out really clearly in my mind was I described to the children how the dam's construction had blocked the ocean migrating salmon from finding their spawning grounds. And the children were about eight, nine, 10 years old, which is really the time in which children develop ethical understanding. It's when they're, um, to use the language of yoga, it's when the heart chakra is being matured and children realize that their acts have impacts on others. And they have begun to have an understanding of morality and right and wrong and justice. And it was just such a perfect age in this one group to represent this story. And this one young little girl held up her hand afterwards when we had question and answer and discussion. And she said, I think I have an idea to help the fish. And I said, great, what's that? And she said, well, couldn't we just put a teeny tiny little hole in the dam, just a little hole so that not too much water came through, but the fish would be able to fit through to go home. And I looked at her in wonder and I thought, yeah, that's really what this is all about. It's about forming narrative to inspire with imagination solutions for the future that are filled with hope and uh, right relation. And a few years ago, I had another experience that um, solidified my, my belief in uh, the power of love uh, and that was in my work with Indigenous peoples, uh, direct work with their history and with them in their social activism and their desire to begin to um, share with the world, uh, Leah, what you talked about, which is that Indigenous way of knowing. And we're seeing more and more of that happening. Um, but occasionally I'm invited into a ceremony or an event at which I am one of very few non-Indigenous people. And this happened in the summer of 2019 in August. Um, there were almost 300 Indigenous people gathered and I was one of about 10. So it was a very 
overwhelming experience to realize that everyone around me, except for a very few people, was in fact indigenous, was directly ancestrally connected through thousands of years of DNA to that land, that river, the Columbia. And what they were doing was re, um, re, hang on, I have to get the right word, reintroducing or returning salmon to the Columbia River above a very large dam, 800 feet high, where those salmon had not actually been above and around that dam for 80 years. So they did a ceremonial release above the dam. There is not yet fish passage around this monolith, but they decided as a collective that they would lead with the fish to begin to raise consciousness and awareness and shift the public mainstream and all of us who live in the region to understand the importance of those fish making it around that 800 foot high dam. Actually, I'm exaggerating, 530 foot high dam. So the ceremony was a cultural release, they called it. When I arrived there, many of them were already gathered in two long lines stretching from the top of a boat ramp down to the bottom of the boat ramp to the edge of a reservoir. And as they were gathered, they were drumming and singing and a refrigerated truck came down behind them, stopped, and some people got out from the tribe and actually netted the fish that were in the refrigerated truck place them one at a time into these rubber bags head down so that their gills would not be damaged and continued their passage through this two this two sided lineup the bag was touched by every single person over 150 of them standing in that line until it reached the water and when it reached the water it was upturned by an elder with the help of a young person and that first fish in 80 years went into the reservoir. It was what happened after that that had a really significant impact on me. I heard a sound I had never heard in my entire life. And that was the collective joy that rose up from that group of people when they realized that that first fish had returned to the Columbia. The Columbia is now heavily dammed. That fish was entering a reservoir, not a free running river. There were all kinds of reasons to be pessimistic, to consider it a, a, almost an act of lunacy to, re, to release this fish into the water. But the indigenous people knew that they were releasing not only a fish, but a spirit. And their own spirits crying out with joy and thanksgiving humbled me and made me realize that the power of love <laughs> is much stronger than I think we can even realize in this moment that we are in. And so I'll leave you with that. Uh, the concept of empathy as a creative tool, uh, my belief in the power of love as I've witnessed it from our indigenous friends, and my deep gratitude for them for the people I work with, the Sinaiks tribe of Southeastern British Columbia and Northeastern Washington, and um, just, just all the indigenous peoples of this world who have survived despite all of colonization to imbue us with a sense of resilience and hope and really more than anything, their love for the land that they live on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen. Um, I appreciate the focus on, on love and imagination. Um, I think certainly we need a, a fair bit of a fair bit of both to um, yeah survive. Yeah, um, for sure. And and um, I think oftentimes, you know, as the book is informed by grief, you know, as as kind of has been said a few times, grief informs but doesn't need to overwhelm in a sense that the work we do can be informed by grief, but not feel grief stricken. I think this is a, a good example of, of kind of loss and resilience. I, I appreciate yeah. that, that story. Yeah. Um, okay, we're gonna turn now to um, Michael, uh, to Michael Tricello.
the other Michael. He's on mute. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks, Lee and um, Michael, for your work on the book. I'm going to uh, share my screen. So my chapter is um, adapted from a book called Infrastructural Brutalism. And so my chapter is basically summarizing some of the theoretical framework for uh, infrastructural brutalism and what that means. Um, essentially, uh, I'm referring to the present moment in which two things are happening simultaneously. Um, on the one hand, of course, you have this um, ecological collapse, uh, the sixth mass extinction event in the history of the planet. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with the many sort of his, uh, ecological crises that are unfolding. Um, simultaneous with that ecological collapse, global capitalism is uh, embarking on a, a, an unprecedented expansion of industrial infrastructure. So you have a, a problem here that uh, I guess is obvious, but what I do in the book is examine the problem through the lens of artistic media. Uh, both the history of how infrastructural brutalism came to be and um, some art, art that is kind of confronting the problem that it presents. So infrastructural brutalism is both a, the, the kind of paradox of the moment and uh, it's also an aesthetic, maybe an aesthetic that we often overlook, the aesthetics of infrastructure. Um, to give you a sense of the scale of the infrastructure project that, that maybe started about 10 years ago um, and will probably last for at least another 20 years, depending on what we do about it, uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative alone is the largest infrastructure project in history. Uh, that's just one nation and it is uh, sort of solidifying its connections with Europe and with uh, Southern Asia by expanding its infrastructure projects. It means new paved roads, new uh, railway lines, new marine ports and so forth. Uh, obviously there's a significant geopolitical impact uh, with all of this uh, new infrastructure building. Um, what I focus on primarily in the in the book is the uh, both the cultural uh, narratives that China is is presenting along with the Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, they've done things like the Shanghai uh, International Film Festival has a, a special category dedicated to Belt and Road uh, countries and the films that they make. Um, they've done things like museum exhibits of photography that has been taken in Belt and Road countries. They've created new grad school programs for uh, basically training business students uh, how to promote the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, they have all kinds of things. There's a, uh, I think it was the government of New Zealand that produced a video game um, based on the Belt and Road Initiative. So one of the sort of overarching uh, interests of the book is, you know, how states have used art to uh, manufacture consent for infrastructure mega projects and how similarly uh, we could use art for uh, countering those mega projects in an age of ecological collapse. Um, there's an historical connection between infrastructural brutalism and brutalist architecture. Uh, so basically, uh, I was looking at, you know, what's the connection between the aesthetic of uh, infrastructure projects and 
uh, architecture more broadly. And after World War II, a group of uh, French public servants traveled around the United States looking at the projects of the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is the government body that uh, was responsible for electrifying the South, essentially. Um, so the Tennessee Valley Authority had produced um, a number of large dams, a number of hydroelectric projects around the southern United States. And one of the architects who was part of this French group touring the U.S. Um, was Le Corbusier, who, of course, became a famous uh, kind of father of uh, brutalist architecture. And he was inspired by things like the Norris Dam that you see in the image here. And he was inspired by the Pentagon, the, the building the Pentagon. Um, and he took this exposed concrete aesthetic back to France where he built some famous, uh, a, a famous apartment complex that is kind of a touchstone in the development of the brutalist architectural style. Um, so, you know, you could see there's an aesthetic connection between uh, infrastructure and architecture. And I was just throughout the book trying to think more about uh, the aesthetics of the infrastructure around us. This is part of, so part of what I'm calling infrastructural brutalism. Um, some of the narratives that, that I look at, these are, are just a few examples of drowned town fiction, for example. Uh, these are stories, I, I focus on uh, literature of the United States and Canada. Um, these are stories about the arrival of hydroelectricity. And they usually involve flooding a town, you know, where the townspeople have to leave so that uh, the area can be flooded as a reservoir for a hydroelectric project. Um, and there are some interesting connections here. So like uh, between the TVA and large infrastructure projects and uh, literary production, um, Cormac McCarthy's father was a senior lawyer in the TVA, for example. And some of McCarthy's early literature uh, looks at the impacts of um, the, the work of the TVA on Eastern Tennessee. Um, a surprising number of U.S. poet laureates wrote <laughs> about uh, drowned town narratives. So James Dickey is just one example. Of course, Deliverance is both a, a famous uh, popular novel and a famous film from the early 1970s. Uh, the only drowned town fiction by uh, an indigenous writer I could find was Thomas King's Green Grass Running Water. Um, and in that, you get this sort of mythological tale that, that questions the very idea of the, the dam itself. So questions a kind of settler sensibility. Um, I also look at uh, the road movie. So these are all artistic genres that uh, foreground infrastructure. And I'm trying to build a kind of history of infrastructural brutalism through the lens of artistic genres. So the road movie seems like a, a natural for this kind of analysis. Um, it, there are many more films examined than just these four, but uh, I, I, one of the interesting things that um, I found was how some of the famous road movies of the 1960s and 70s, um, like Vanishing Point or Two Lane Blacktop, um, they're, they're, they're usually called existential road movies. It's where the hero of the film, which is usually uh, a white guy, drives around and that's kind of the whole purpose of his existence is driving. Um, and it's interesting how these films tend to erase what some scholars refer to as transportation racism. So there's a kind of nihilistic white hero who, whose uh, preoccupation with driving kind of erases some of the, what you might call the materiality of the road. Um, there's a surprising uh, lack of theorizing the materiality of the road 
in the scholarship around the road movie itself. And of course, some of the uh, more recent road movies like Mad Max Fury Road kind of examine forms of governmentality uh, following the disappearance of roads. Uh, the, the whole Max, uh, I guess the four Mad Max films kind of move from being like a right-wing libertarian story uh, <laughs> to kind of a left-wing environmentalist narrative about uh, who destroyed the world. And of course, paved roads are, uh, uh, you know, a part of that scenario, but by Ferry Road, the, the roads have almost completely disappeared from the narrative. Um, I also look at um, the photography of oil landscapes. Uh, it's kind of a natural because I'm talking to you from Alberta, Canada, which is the uh, home of the oil industry in Canada. Uh, I guess think of it as the uh, Canadian Texas. Um, and so I look at, you know, through these photographs like uh, Edward Bertinsky's photograph in front of you, um, some of, thinking through what kinds of ruins the uh, oil capitalist landscape will leave behind. Because when we're doing environmentalist work, we're not simply uh, working with a blank slate. You know, there, there are uh, impacts from oil capitalism that are going to last for hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe even millions of years. Um, when we think about biodiversity loss or climate change, some of these things are going to be around for a very long time. So it's not just about what the landscape looks like now, but um, the impacts of what you could call these hyper objects uh, centuries down the road. And finally, uh, I look at death train narratives um, all the way from actual historical uh, death trains like the Ugandan Railroad, uh, which was created during the colonial period, primarily for extracting uh, resources. And, uh, you know, through things like the death trains of the Holocaust, uh, through um, up to the present where I look at fictional death train narratives like Snowpiercer and Train to Busan, which are kind of revolutionary narratives that uh, look at uh, revolution from different perspectives. So Snowpiercer is kind of like um, revolution from the perspective of the proletariat in the back of the train. And Train to Poussin is revolution from the perspective of the bourgeoisie or the rich people. Uh, the primary character is, is a, a kind of uh, you know, finance guy and at the beginning of the film, which is a zombie outbreak film, uh, he, he's told that it might be a general strike um, instead of a, you know, a zombie outbreak. So these, but these films are, are useful for us thinking through um, uh, environmentalist action, revolutionary action, because frankly, the only thing that is going to um, sort of rectify this situation is to abolish capitalism uh, and replace it with something that is not inherently ecocidal. Um, so these are movies that kind of work through revolutionary moments under the conditions of infrastructural brutalism. And I think they have some useful lessons in that regard. Um, finally, in the conclusion, I'm talking about uh, what I call Brzezantic politics. And it's kind of like an obvious flip side of um, infrastructural brutalism. If the problem, you know, if one of the problems that we face right now is that capitalism is uh, building at it at a rapid pace, it is uh, sort of closing down the escape routes from ecological collapse, uh, then obviously a tactical necessity is to slow industrial capitalism's ecological devastation and human subjugation. Um, and this will require retrofitting some uh, infrastructure. It will require uh, preventing some infrastructure projects from happening at all. Uh, and, and it will require some degree of sabotage because it is clear that the that capitalism is incapable 
of, um, uh, of becoming anything but an ecocidal uh, social order. So uh, it's, not, it's not like capitalism will have this sort of you know, moment of, of conscience, <laughs> a crisis of consciousness, of conscience, sorry, um, and suddenly become uh, a less destructive system. That is, uh, you know, that is not possible. It has to be replaced. Uh, so when I'm talking about Brzezantic politics, I'm talking about the ability to shatter uh, uh, these, what I guess you would call techno-social assemblages, like the way capitalism and the state are constructing things that are uh, ecologically d destructive. And so we have to sort of undo, unmake uh, large portions of what state capitalism has created. And I guess I just wanted to note in closing that this is the 100th anniversary of the bombing of Wall Street. Uh, it's kind of interesting, like uh, as a reflection of how we've lost so much of our Brzezantic capacity, our capacity to shatter things and the state and capital have, have sort of cornered the market on that, if you like. So I'll, I'll stop there and try to turn this over. Thank you, Michael. Um, I appreciate that. And I mean, the first time I know you and I met, I remember being really enamored by your focus on, on aesthetics and, and overlapping some of these, some of these things, which to me are more theoretical tools for understanding power and, and overlaying them on top of architecture and cinema. It's really, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, and, and in an unintentional, but, but sort of natural bridging um, towards uh, extremely brutalist art or extremely brutalist infrastructure, we'll um, turn to, to Randall, who's um, talking about the border wall in the South. Yep, perfect segue. Thanks, um, appreciate it, Michael and Lee, for, for putting the, the volume together. It was great to work on this with you all. I, I thought the prompt was spot on for the moment in which we find ourselves, and, and everyone who's spoken so far, I think, has really clued us in to the essential challenges of our time. I mean, you know, in some ways, like we we have to make something of the world as it's as it's being performed and implemented around us. Um, you know, we can't only be in a space of trying to, um, you know, to to resist it in the sense that some of it is um, beyond our capacity as individuals to you know to straightforwardly um, you know. Uh, subvert, I guess, in, in some ways. Like, it doesn't mean we abandon the project. It means we have to also think of resilience as a form of resistance and subversion, too. Um, and that's part of the toolkit at the same time. And so for me, when I read the prompt, what I clued into immediately was something very tangible, which is kind of my perspective sometimes, which was the border wall between the United States and Mexico. And it's one of those things that, you know, kind of exists at a scale that, that despite the, uh, the work of activists and advocates and um, human rights actors and environmental um, uh, entities, you know, the wall keeps perpetuating. And it, it really is kind of a, a, a bipartisan tragedy in many ways, although it certainly tips toward uh, a side that, that takes a much more overt view of securitization as the antidote to, um, to all emerging problems. And I think the quote that Michael just used at the end of his presentation really sums it up closing down escape routes from ecological collapse. In many ways, that's what this border wall is. Um, it was always intended to be that, even before the language of climate change and mass displacement of people due to environmental factors was really in the vernacular. It was already known, and it was understood that even if you just looked at it through the lens of political economy, people were going to be displaced. People were going to seek higher ground, safer ground, better futures, um, you know, all the things that, um, that, that people do naturally, but, you know, across international borders, it becomes highly problematic, um, you know, in the way that it's constructed. So even though we usually think of the border wall between the U.S. and Mexico as a political, um, you know, a political tool um, through the lens of social and economic issues, it's also an environmental catastrophe. And it turns out those things are deeply connected. And so I use a lot of rhetorical devices in the chapter, looking at the interruption of flow, the bifurcation of habitats, the, um, the severing of cultures where, you know, so the border between the US and Mexico has historically been one of maximal exchange. It was a border where that, you know, families like 
you know, transected the border. Um, the, even still, the in Arizona, the uh, Tohono O'odham's reservation like straddles the border. It's not in either the U.S. or Mexico. It's in both. You know, um, and, and habitats don't care about borders like that. I mean, the reification of a border is fundamentally anti-ecological. You know, it's not that um, in past uh, you know moments people didn't try to sometimes channelize or encourage things to flow in certain directions, but to reify it in a wall, to make that permanent is a different kind of fixture. And it really flies in the face of, um, you know, whatever conceptions we might have of justice, peace building, um, you know, the, the more dynamic ways that, um, you know, that reality often expresses itself. A border wall just sort of tries to preempt all of that. Like it doesn't want to have that conversation. You know, it wants to basically um, impose itself and prevent, you know, the water from flowing and prevent the cultures from exchanging. And so for me, when I entered the subject, I did have some slides, by the way, and I'm not going to show them because they're really wordy and it's 822 here and I realize I'm the last thing standing between you all and your weekend. So, um, so I'll kind of keep it short and just narrate in the spirit of storytelling. I had a couple of visuals, but, um, but I'll, I'll try to paint a picture um, with, with words instead and maybe the, the visual behind me can, can help a little bit too. Um, so it's not just me talking. Um, but a few years ago, many years ago actually now, I was invited to a conference and the theme was on porous borders. And it wasn't totally clear from the framing whether they were imagining that phrase in a negative or positive light. And it was a little bit of both. I, I knew the organizer a bit. And I think what they, what they were going for was because the concept was so much in the vernacular that porous borders were seen as a problem politically, right? Like all of these images and associations of this, this border, this, this incredible 2,000, almost 2,000 mile long border that, you know, that, that stretches across the entire Southwest, um, you know, with our closest, you know, trading partner on the planet and all of these things. Um, you know, it, it's like the idea that somehow this border is too porous and it's letting all these things in. And we know the ways this gets politicized. I mean, you know, you don't have to look too far uh, into the, the, you know, history of it. It's in very contemporary still. I mean, in some ways in 2016, you know, Trump's signature issue then was really running on build the wall and have Mexico pay for it. It's all this sort of scare tactics, tactics about caravans and streaming hordes of people. We know the ways that, you know, the, the anti-immigration <clears throat> narrative is so uh, politicized and taps into deeply rooted fears uh, and, and racialized discourses. That's pretty obvious. It's not even subtle. It's not meant to be subtle. So porous borders was constructed as this, you know, uh, the phrase was used to, to signify this highly problematic situation where we've got this open border and it's way too, you know, way too lax and people can just stream across it. And, you know, all the, the, the fears that are, you know, deeply, you know, embedded in the, <clears throat> in the political narrative come to the fore. But when I thought about the phrase more, I realized that a porous border is actually you know, kind of like what makes any life possible at all. Like if you didn't have a porous border around you, there'd be no exchange between you and your environment, right? You'd be, you'd ossify basically. And you could argue that the same thing is true, whether it's a gated community in the suburbs somewhere, or whether it's a nation that's walling itself in, even if it thinks it's walling others out, there is a kind of ossification that happens. Um, and so I, I work through a lot of these themes in the piece. Um, I'll try to highlight a couple of them. So, you know, I start in the landscape and I think we've all, everyone who's spoken tonight, which I greatly appreciate the, um, the setting forth of this tone is really kind of walking that fine line between crisis and possibility. You know, like, like we, we don't, we can't skip either of those. You know, like if we only stay on the crisis side of the ledger, as many have pointed out tonight, um, even if that feels like we're being critical and we're really digging in deep, if we just end it there, you know, we sort of have abdicated our responsibility to articulate another way of being through all of this. It doesn't mean we have to put a rosy gloss on it. And I think one of the speakers mentioned that as well. So we don't skip to the other side, which is that let's not talk about the crisis. Let's just imagine the possibilities. We can't do that either. That's just decontextualized and not really grounded in the, the world as we find it. So somehow in the both, that dialectic between crisis and possibility, I think is where we're situating 
this notion, and it's in the title, right? Environmental loss and resilience. We're coupling those two things. Um, and in some ways, you know, maybe it's the, the tragedy and or uh, beauty of our own existence is that many things have that same kind of duality that we, you know, we, we consume to survive, but, um, but too much of it winds up pushing us into a place where it impinges on our capacity to live at all. So we take moments of this, right? You can take any slice of, of, of the, the challenge. Um, for me, I took the border wall because uh, I had lived in the Southwest for many years. And, um, and, and it really stood out as, as the sort of like iconic feature of not just the geographical landscape, but the cultural and political landscape as well. But what really kind of confounded me about it was that when I first encountered the border, and I don't mean the one that's sort of like at the established points of crossing, if you, you know, go to one of the major border crossing points and you sort of go through that, that's not quite what the border actually is. Those are just moments where it crystallizes and that's a, you know, an extremely securitized uh, space on its own and, and kind of always has been. But what's, what's become more apparent in recent years is the attempt to stretch that ribbon of securitization into areas that are just utterly inconsistent with that feature, right? I mean, these are not places where you would look at it and say, there's a real threat gonna, that's gonna happen here. You know, the border is like, you expect to see some dramatic feature if you, you know, like where's the border between these two countries? And in many places, there's nothing there. There's literally nothing. In other places, it's just a thin, wire or a cattle fence that you could lift up and just go, you know, there's nothing. In other places, it, it goes through some of the most beautiful mountain passes and vistas that you could imagine. And it really defies the idea that there's a serious problem here. Um, but by, by making the wall something um, that's, you know, that becomes a kind of um, icon of control, it has this, and I think, you know, Michael's phrase of, uh, in, was it industrial brutalism, right? It's sort of in that genre, like it's intended to tell that, that story, like it, it beyond whether it's functional, you know? I mean, it, maybe you can think of the wall as sort of a dam on land, right? And however high you make it, um, you know, nature is always, nature including people are always working uh, around it and through it in some way, shape or form. But there was a moment um, where, the aestheticization of this, like that it, it is intended to communicate something, was actually articulated by, um, by Trump back in 2016 or 2017. And he had said something about um, not, not just wanting a barrier, because in most places it really is nothing more than just a barrier. He wanted a 55 foot tall wall. And here's the quote that he gave to describe what his vision of this wall was. So quote, he wanted the wall to be impenetrable, physical, tall, powerful, and beautiful. You know, and that just really jumped off the page at me, like just that um, what kind of, you know, psychic uh, externalization is being projected there, right? To have this wall be this sort of testament to, uh, to that kind of, you know, self-construction um, as if that would be a legacy project or something. But the real, you know, purpose of it obviously is to, um, is to you know, separate, to, um, to divide, to wall in as much as it is to wall out, to, um, to meet a complex, rapidly changing world with, with many um, challenges at hand that are going to destabilize and are destabilizing people's lives everywhere, to meet that with, um, you know, with a, a completely outmoded, heavy-handed form of control, as if you could do that. So rather than address root causes or get clear on the economic systems underscoring this rather than really delve into climate change in a meaningful way, the answer becomes to just securitize, to just kind of put this, um, you know, put this feature in place. And what you find is that it interrupts the flow of water sources, it bifurcates um, uh, wildlife corridors, it separates animal populations and threatens them with extinction because they can't meet and connect. Um, it separates families, cultures, uh, you know, it, it just has this starkly divisive quality to it that I think is, um, is worth thinking through. And so there's been real, a lot of really interesting treatments, um, including Todd Miller had written a book called Storming the Wall. And he puts it in the context of uh, the US-Mexico border wall being like one of the iconic features of this landscape, which we're likely to see more of writ large, where when confronted with a threat, a complex threat, 
we will reduce it in this very, you know, um, you know, oversimplified way to something tangible, and it will be met with this kind of um, mechanical form of, of security. And this comes up in so many different discourses. I won't list them out for you, and maybe you can find connections to things that you're doing um, around it. There was one, one image that I had intended to show, and I'll just kind of close with it because I thought it was an interesting um, uh, alternative way to express this. Um, there's something called um, uh, Gabion. It's G-A-B-I-O-N. It's basically a a, a, a wire cage filled with rocks. And so you can imagine that, like, you know, like people who have lived in this arid region for a long time, sometimes do, you know, kind of suggest where the water might flow or try to make use of its natural flow. And when they did, they would often use structures like that. And so it's permeable, right? It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a crate of rocks. The water still flows through it, but it subtly suggests ways that it might you know, veer off or be used in other in other capacities without just imposing this kind of permanent um, permanent scar on the land in the process. And I just thought that it, and Todd Miller is the one who who used that image to describe another way of you know like not just being at the the whim of what you know what nature supplies, like working with it, but not doing this uh, this form of like monolithic control. So I just thought that image stood out nicely. If you get a chance, Google the term G-A-B-I-O-N and you'll see that it's like a way of, of um, interacting with the environment um, that doesn't run afoul of some of the things that we've talked about today. Just the last part of the piece that I wrote is essentially just a little nod to the future. And I connected the two discourses of restorative justice and restoration ecology, and then landed on that word restoration, um, thinking about not only you know, getting it together for what comes next, but also going back to really deal with the traumas that, that have been inflicted up to this point. We, we do have to do that kind of hard work before we can actually imagine a, a meaningful way of going forward. So that's a somewhat rambling um, look at, at how I interpreted the prompt and just grateful to have heard from everybody, um, you know, who was part of this really fabulous project. So thank you again, Michael and Lee, for putting it all together. Thank you, Randall. For for uh, speaking. Um, we appreciate your, your words and your, your work on the book as well. Um, so I'm noting that it is uh, five minutes after we were supposed to start question and answer, or five minutes after we were supposed to conclude, 20 minutes after we were supposed to start question and answer, which as we were setting up, we were wondering if we needed to, to build more time in, and, and none of us ever do. Um, so I, I, I hesitate to kind of close us off without allowing room for questions, but I also realize that these few people in our time zone, we have now worked through the majority of the dinner hours. Um, it looks like, um, so yeah, so I think I'll, I'll kind of call it, call it quits there. Um, I think we're all pretty accessible people. Um, we're all available um, online if, if folks have questions, at least speaking for myself, I'm happy to, to talk with folks um, about these topics, but I, I do want to be respectful that people need to probably feed their families and their bellies and whatnot. Um, so I want to encourage uh, folks that they're able to continue joining us um, throughout October and November. Um, if you're interested in joining any of the sessions for October, the link you used um, tonight will, will take you through the rest of the month of October. Um, and if you're interested in joining any of the sessions uh, in November, all you have to do is do the same process um, for November. So on behalf of the Peace, Peace and Justice Study Association, uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight on behalf of me and myself and the other contributors in the book. Thank you all. Enjoy your evening and your weekend. Good night.